Hello everyone, and welcome back to Unlocking the Power of You. This is our third week being together, and we're gonna talk about some things that you might find interesting. Some of it you may know, and much of it you may not know, but the purpose of this is to help all of us become better being who we should be and who we need to become in the long run. So I'm gonna be, you're gonna hear some Bible study today. You're gonna to get some Bible study. Some people say, okay, we don't know who you are, but it's an opportunity to get, for you to get to know a little bit more about me and my background. As I said, I'm 48 years in the ministry. This is something that I love, and this will help you better understand why I do what I do and why I love doing what I'm doing. And in this studio with me, also before I get, go any further, if you're out there right now, please put one of these on. This is that mask. I'm telling you to wear a mask out there. Help keep everyone safe. Now, with that, I want to jump right into what we talked about a little bit last week, and that is who you are or who are you. Many of us still don't know who we are. We think we know who we are, but we're going to show you and help you understand better that person who is inside of you that needs to come out. Many of us don't know how to bring that person out, but this study, these courses, and this time is going to be given towards us understanding who we are, where we are, why we are, what we do, why we do what we do, and why some of us are so miserable. And I want to say this as well. I know a lot of you out there who are watching this video are hurting, going through certain things. What we intend to do is help you resolve some issues. But in order to resolve those issues, you're going to have to participate. You're going to have to do something more than just say, hey, I watched, I heard, I listened. The change, the change that's going to come has to come from you. We will give you the information that you need, but you will have to, as we said last week, you will have to apply that information that you get. And if you really want to see the change take place after the application comes that transformation in your life, and that's what we're going to look at. So it's important for us to all understand who we are, what we are, why we are, what, as I said, and what we do, why we do what we do. So I want to start out by saying this, and I want all of those who are parents out there, because I know many of you who are parents, we're going to be talking about things that may offend you, but sometimes you need to be offended. You need to have your feelings hurt in order for you to grow properly. And that's what this program is all about. And I heard some people talking about this recently, so I'm going to start with this to help you understand something. If you are a parent, I'm gonna write a word down here and I want you to look at this word and I want you to begin to analyze it. And this is the word. I want you to look at that word and I want you to look at that word very carefully. Because many of us are parents out here today, and we don't really know what parenting is all about. Some of our children are hurt because of us as parents. We as adults don't do the right thing. So here's what I want you to do when you look at this word. And I've used this in seminars before. But look at this word. There's, there's a couple words that you, is also located in this word that I want you to be aware of. Number one, you are a parent. Oh, by the way, as a parent. I want you to understand something. You do not own your children. Some of us act like our children are our property, so we can misuse them, we abuse them, we do things to them, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in upcoming programs, how victims of bullies, how parents can become bullies, how we do things to our children to hurt our children, psychologically, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So with this word, notice something. In the, within this word, there's several other words. Number one, you're a parent. You're not a property owner. Your children don't belong to you. But here's what I want you to understand. Parents, look at this word in here. R. Now here's the last word. What do we get up, come up with? It says parents. Parents are renting. Your children do not belong to you. They don't, you're not owning your children. They're on loan to you from God. God has loaned us our children, and yet we talk and we belittle our children as though they are our property. God is offended with us and think that we own our children, which means this also. None of us have the right to talk down to our children. I recently had a conversation with somebody who said, you know, I had to cuss my child out. Why? Why would you want to cuss out your child? First off, in order to cuss them out, you have to be the owner. Here's the other thing. Many of us want our children, 
our children to be obedient to us, don't we? We always say, hey, I want my child to obey me. We say, I want my child to obey me. Now, we want our children to obey us. And this is what we're going to talk about today, too. We want our children to obey us, but are we obeying God the same way that we want our children to obey us? Are we doing what God tells us to do when we want our children to do what we tell them to do? So are we repositioning ourselves to feel that we are greater than God and in order for us to tell our children, obey me, obey me, do what I say, do what I say, do what I say. That means that you are in control of them. Now, at the same time, you want them to listen to you. Are you listening to God? We're not listening to God the same way we want our children to listen to us. We want them to obey us. And we are responsible towards one another. God has an expectation for us. He don't expect us as parents to be idle. Don't talk about you love, you love your child and say, I love you. I love you. What does that mean exactly then? When I say I love you, do I put that love first? And if when I'm talking about love, you have to love this person first. Then you have to love self. If I'm talking about love, the first love I'll have is towards God. If I have a love towards God, then my love towards myself and my love towards others. Now, let's go to that third one. Love self. Then we can also we can't have love. You can't talk about love without knowing God because the Bible says God is love. So the first love, the first act of love is my loving God. And then I have to, once I love God, I can love myself. And if I love myself, I can love others. Now, this is also the thing we have to consider. If I love God properly, if I'm loving myself properly, I'm never going to be abusive to my loved ones, will I? Nope. There's no way I'm going to be abusive to my wife to my husband, to my children, if I love God, as he has said first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So the first love is God love. And that word love, in the truest sense of this word love, I'll put it up here. Many of us don't know that word. It's agape. Agape is the Greek word for love. This is the strongest tense of love that there is. This is godly love, which means it is a, uh, a, a spiritual love that reaches beyond just us loving self, loving others. We have to love God first because God, the Bible says in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the first love is that agape love. And how do we know that God's love is agape? Because of what it said in John chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the first aspect of love is divine love. This is divine love. The love of God. You cannot love God on a physical level. I, now I'll leave this for a moment so everybody can see it. That's, it's a video, so I mean you can freeze it and look at it anytime you want. So when we look at agape love, or agape love as some people say, that is the ultimate love. That is the supreme love. That is the divine love that comes from God. And this is the other thing that we'll, we'll have to look at as well. When we were born, when you were born, as a matter of fact, let me ask this question. Where were you 100 years ago? 100 years ago, none of us were here. So if you weren't here 100 years ago, where were you? Where were you 80 years ago? You weren't here. Many of us. Mm -hmm. But now let's take this scenario. If we weren't here, where were we? Who is eternal? God. God was here 100 years ago, wasn't he? Yeah. God was here 80 years ago. God was here 2,000 years ago. So before you and I were born, 
Where were we? We were, this is going to blow you away, I think. Before you and I were born, we were with God. Now, how does that make sense? Now, if we were with God, then this is going to really take away all the excuses we're going to hear later on and down the road as we continue this program. People are saying, well, I don't this and I don't, I don't this and I don't understand that. We were with God in the beginning, from the beginning, even though there was not a, a, a heaven to speak of. God was here. God was here. Now, if you were born in 1940, 1930, 1950, here's what God did. When we, God was here in heaven, he was in heaven. Now, how did we get here? We were born. We were born what? Through a man and a woman. We were born. God sent us through the, the, the union of a man and a woman. We were born. And here's that infant. That's us. There was a time that God decided of his own volition that we were going to be born. In order for us to be born, there was a union between a man and a woman. That union between a man and woman brought us into the world. Now, this is why I said that we don't belong to ourselves. When we came into this world as a, an infant, God is the one sent us. Now, this is something we're going to talk about later on as we progress, too. God is always connected to us. How can we get to know God when we come from here, here to here to here as an infant? Then we go from an infant to a child to a adolescent and to an adult. There's a process. And remember, we talked about that in the interview. We go through a process. We didn't just get here. God sent us here. When your dad and your mom had a union, we were born. When we were born, we came into the world because of God. It wasn't just that these people did this. It's because God sent us. So we were with God in eternity. Once we came from eternity, and this is what I want us to understand something too. We came from eternity into time. When we were born, we were born into time. And when we were born as these infants, God was still in control, and God is still in control. God is in control, and he should be in control of us as adults. Many of us miss the mark from here to here because we get lifted up within ourselves as though we're in charge. None of us are in charge of us. God is still in control of us. God is still in charge. Why? This is, if you will, the umbilical cord. God's umbilical cord, what is God's umbilical cord in us? Spirit. The spirit in us. How do we know this is true? Because in Genesis, first in Genesis 1, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, Elohim, or God's name there, Elohim, God said, and let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. And then it goes from Genesis 1.26 over here to Genesis 2 and 7. When it says, now, he said, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness. But then it says, God created man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So that means that God's breath, that spirit, in us, in our bodies, this belongs to God. This, the umbilical cord to, from God, is linked to each one of us, because when we die, that spirit goes back to God, our bodies go to the dust, and either our soul is going to heaven or going to hell. 
I hope so far everybody's with me. <clears throat> this is what you have to understand as well. You and I are, and we're going to come back to this aspect, man and woman, that's done. We've been born. We're here. Remember, now the spirit is a part of us. The spirit that came from God. The spirit came from God that's in that infant. Now, here's the thing. When it says God breathed the man's nostrils, the breath of life, a man became a living soul. Here's the other thing we have to consider here. We are in these bodies, if you will. We're in these bodies. But what's in here? This is a heart. Let's say, let's make it look like the ones that we're so used to seeing. We're, that heart. This heart is only the beating for the body. Because inside this, we are spiritual beings housed in physical bodies. In other words, you and I are part of, we're an extension of God. We became an extension of God by our birth. You are part of God because of that Holy Spirit, not only the Holy Spirit, but the natural spirit that is in us. God gave us a spirit. He breathed into man's nostrils, the breath of life. Man became a living soul. That means we have a heartbeat. But guess what? That heartbeat belongs to God. Don't belong to you. See how selfish we can be? We think that we're here on our own. We are not here. Every one of us here has an expiration date. You were born with an expiration date. We were born with a limitation, a, a physical limitation, not a spiritual limitation. We're going to, we're going to leave this body one day. And this body is only the housing of the spirit that is in you. And where's the spirit, at? This, this true spirit of who we are is in this thing that we call the brain. You remember those signs when we were kids and you go to the mall and they always say, you are here? Yeah. You, you look for that, it says, you are here? Well, here's where we are. You are here. Now, this is the thing we have to understand. This, this thing is not really who we are. That's only to keep our heart beating. Remember Barney Clark, the man who had that big metal heart back in the 70s, say, hey, this man got this false heart, this machine's keeping him alive. That machine wasn't keeping him alive. It was that soul that was inside of him that was given to him by God. So once we die, that goes back. So what we are, where we are is inside here, but we don't know we can't touch it. We can't touch who you are. Because we're spirit beings. We're spirit beings that God placed in a human body so I can know exactly what you feel. I can know exactly what you do. Because my spirit, you can't see my spirit, but you can see my body. God gave it to me so I can look in your face and see whether you're angry, when you're mad, and what you might do. Because we carry out those things in these bodies. When a parent is beating on their child, when they're uh, deliberately doing things and are hurting their children, it's because they are estranged from God. Spiritually, they're not thinking properly. They're only thinking about what they want physically, that physical thing that is going on. And we have to move beyond the physical to the spiritual. If I I have a spiritual understanding of who God is and my relationship to God, and I want to understand this too. We're not going to be talking about religion, we're talking about relationship. This is our relationship to God. What is your relationship to God? Our relationship with God is dependent on our relationship to who? His Son, Jesus Christ. We're not religious. O-U-S. We're not religious people, although some of us carry on like we're religious. We go to church religiously. We give religiously. We do things religiously. But God is not concerned with our religion or our religiousness. He is concerned with this. God's concern is what is your relationship to him? What is your relationship to him? And based on your relationship to God, I'll understand your relationship to me. Because if you don't like God, guess what? You can't like me. If you don't really love God, 
You can't love me properly. Didn't we just show the love of God and love of self and then love of others? God is simply saying there's a process. Are you in that process? Religious, hey, it's good to be religious for some people because religion gives people an, an opportunity to argue. We, people re religiously argue about, hey, are you a Baptist? Are you Presbyterian? Are you Lutheran? Are you Catholic? Are you this? Are you that? They want to argue that because that it's a matter of superior and inferior. I am better than you because I'm a Baptist. I'm an Anabaptist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Catholic. There's always religion is all the things we debate over and we argue over religious things. But here's the thing with God. God wants to know how is your relationship with him? Because if my relationship with him is defined, my relationship with you will be defined. That makes sense, doesn't it? Our relationship, we spend a lot of time on religion. But guess what? When we get to heaven, there's not going to be a Baptist heaven, a Presbyterian heaven, or a Lutheran heaven, or a Catholic heaven, or a Mormon, or Jehovah's Witness heaven. There's just heaven. And the only way we can get into heaven is because our relationship. And remember what a relationship is. A relationship is between individuals. A religion I can religiously come in and sit down. I can religiously comb my hair. I religiously brush my teeth. I religiously get up in the morning, put clothes on. That's a religion. Religions are things that we can do habitually and regularly. But a relationship means, and this relationship we're talking about should be an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Is your relationship with Jesus Christ intimate? Most times it's not. People will quote the Bible back and forth and forth and back. They quote scripture. Here's the thing about the Bible. Because you know what it says don't mean you know what it means. And because you know what it means don't mean you know how it applies. So there are things that we have to go through to become the person that God has called us to be in the relationship that we have with him. This is the divine relationship. And that divine relationship God simply said, okay, good that you know the word. And I say this to my Bible study class. Hey, when we pray, we're talking to God. When we read the Bible, God's talking to us. Now, how busy are you that you don't have time to pick up the Bible? I don't have time to read the Bible. Well, my pastor said, my deacon said, my teacher said, no, it's up to you to define your relationship. God wants to know, are you intimate with him? And I'm not, I'm not talking about sexually. But God wants to know, are you intimately acquainted with him, intimately acquainted with him, intimately know him, intimately spending time with him? This is what I had to learn when I was coming up. I heard a lot of people quoting scripture. I saw a lot of people in the church doing all kind of church things. But they weren't doing godly things. They had a religion, but they didn't have a relationship. They had the words right, but didn't have the life right. Why do our children not see God? Because they're looking for God in those of us who claim to know him and they're not seeing anything. Why should I believe in your God and your Christ when I can't see you walking and believe in what you're telling me to believe? Why is it, mama, you want me to obey you and yet you say you love the Lord and I never see you showing your love for the Lord? Daddy, I know you say you love the Lord. You're supposed to be the leader in the home. I never see you at home. And when you come home, you got the bottle in your hand or the can in your hand. And you're fussing and cussing and throwing fits. And yet you expect me to grow up properly. You're not giving me a good example. Here's a relationship. People are looking at your relationship. I don't believe in your God because I haven't seen God. The Bible says none of us have seen God. And in as much as we haven't seen God, what we need to have is a representation of God through the people of God that he has created. Remember, in heaven, God sent us to the earth and he sent us to the earth with a reason and for a purpose. He said, I'm sending you to be an example. I'm sending you as a light into the world. Mom and dad, you're supposed to be a light. Mom and dad, as you're watching this, if you're not being a light to your children, something's wrong. Then you wonder why your child is so bad and doing certain things. It's because you're giving them an example. Don't tell them they need to be 
uh, uh, loving and obedient to you when you are not being loving and obedient to God? Hey, what is the relationship like? Remember, you are a spirit being in this brain of yours is the consciousness that God put there. And you and I are accountable to God. Not only are we accountable to God, but we are accountable to one another. What are you doing with your life? And here, we, we, it's another thing that we do all the time. Our, we always tell our children, do as I say, don't do as I do. And we expect our children not to be followers of us. You know what? All of us are this. We're all disciples. But of what? What are you following? Who are you following? Don't talk about how much we love the Lord. Don't say that our, child, our children need to obey us. And if you look in the Bible, I'll give you this as you, uh, those of you who like studying the word of God, I'm praying that you do really like studying the word of God. As I said, I want you to understand my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is based on what he has said in the word, what I've uh, picked up from the word of God, what I've allowed the Holy Spirit to say in my life and to me. And that's what we, we miss the mark because we don't really listen to what the Holy Spirit says unless he's saying what we want to hear. Isn't that something? We're quick to say, hey, I believe the word of God. I believe God. I believe God. Let me tell you what I had to learn a, a while ago. And I, say, I shared this before. I was homeless. And the times I was homeless, those were struggling moments because either I was going to believe what God said or I was going to reject what God said. If you're going to believe what God said, that means you have to be ready and willing to go through the storm. Many of us are really, really willing to go through the storm. We don't mind believing God as long as things are going our way. We don't mind telling our children, hey, God is good, isn't he? We say it all the time. No, we say, God is good all the time. God is good. We hear that. But what does that mean? I hope it means that you have put it to the test. You are genuine. You are sincere. Not just when it's, it's sunny and, and great outside. Can you be put to the test? All the words you speak. The words you live. We are spirit beings. And in the Bible, it, and let me put this back on here. If we look at this, the greatest example that you and I have of, of this happening, if you go into the book of Luke, and I'm just giving you this, uh, hopefully you guys who are readers, Luke chapter 1, chapter 3, we see this uh, occurring in the life of Jesus. And remember, God sent Christ to be the ultimate example to all of us. Being the ultimate example, none of us have an excuse that we say we can't do certain things because God simply said, yes, you can do it because I showed you how to do it. In the book of Luke, we find in that first chapter, it says, we find unto us born this day in the city of David. Christ, Jesus Christ. This is Jesus. He was born as an infant. Later on, we find that he's a child because Herod was, wanted to kill all the kids two years and under. He wanted all of them dead. Then next time we see Jesus Christ in Luke, he's 12 years old. And next time we see him in the book of Luke, he's an adult. He's 30. He's 30 years of age. So we find that God sent Jesus the same way he sent us. We were born through a parent, some parents, as an infant. We have to grow. We're learning. As an adolescent, we're learning. When Jesus was found in the temple after his parents looked for him and said, hey, we couldn't find you. Where, why did you treat us this way? Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. God's hands was on Christ that Jesus Christ at a young age has God's hands been on us. Yes. But we tell God hands off. When God is calling, are we listening? And Brother Larry asked me that during the interview process. He said, oh, how long ago? I said, hey, I came to know the Lord over 50 years ago. But it was a few years later that I actually paid attention to the call and went out and did what he said do. See, we hear God's voice. But we just don't respond to it because most of the time we're afraid that God is going to ask us to do something we don't want to do. 
Now, what does that mean in everything that we're saying? This is all a part of unlocking the power of you. Until we know these situations, the circumstances, this was our example. Jesus became our example. So what did God do with this? He simply said, this is what I'm going to do with all of your excuses. I'm going to wipe them away. None of us have or has an excuse with God. None of us can make an excuse that is valid with God. We have to do what we have been called to do. We must do what we've been assigned to do. We must do what God has given us and put us in this process of doing. Even the things that we have that we say has hurt us in our lives. You lose your job. You lose a home. You lose a loved one. That does not matter. God simply says, are you still going to do this with me? Are you going to still trust me? Will you trust me when your loved one passes on? Will you trust me when the job is gone? Will you trust me when the food is not there? Will you trust me when your friends abandon you? Trust. Now, this is the thing. Either you trust or you rust. That's just, that you can trust or rust. When I say rush, that means you stand around, you're sitting around, you're doing nothing. Poor little old me. Woe is me. Why me? Why me? Why did this happen to me? God has a plan. You are part of the plan. You're in the process. You're a part of God's ultimate goal. What is his goal? He wants souls saved. And guess what we want? We want souls saved. We just don't want to be the ones out there doing the work to get them saved. I'll say amen. Amen, Tim. Because that's what it comes down to. Lord, I don't mind doing anything you want me to do as long as I don't have to do anything for it. This is a part of it. And you'll see that every book I've written, they all are saying the same thing. I'm asking the question throughout all the writings, what are you doing to make a difference? It's easy to sit around and point. It's easy to sit around and talk about what can be done, what should be done, what might be done. But what are you doing? John chapter 5, the man at the pool, he laid there at the pool and he complained. When he got to the pool, Jesus walked over to him and he said, hey, do you want to be made whole? The man said, oh, you know, every time I get ready to go into the pool... Somebody stepped in before me. Someone got ahead of me. So what did the man do? He started blaming others for his situation he was in. He blamed them. This is who he blamed. He blamed the person who got in the pool, and he blamed, blamed the people who brought him to the pool. How did he blame those people? Because he said to Jesus, every time I'm ready to go in, somebody steps in before me. In other words, the people who brought me aren't taking me up there fast enough to get me in the pool before everybody so I can receive the healing. Jesus did not ask this man, did he want to get into the pool? He asked him the question. He said, do you want to be made whole? He had an uh, a eureka moment, an uh, aha moment. Wait a minute. You didn't ask me if I want to get in the pool. No, he just asked you, did you want to be made whole? Oh, yeah, I want to be made whole. Now, here's the thing about God. God is always going to do his part. But are you going to do yours? He told the man, he said, if you want to be made whole, then take up your bed, get up right now and go home. Now, how many of us hear what God says, but just unwilling to do what he said? Do this man heard everything Jesus said, but he was unwilling at first. Then he realized that he had to participate in the blessing. He had to participate in the healing. And that's where you and I come into it. Look, when your family is messed up and things are not going right at home, God is simply saying, are you willing to participate in the healing process? Are you willing to dig into it instead of saying, hey, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Get it together. No, they need more than that. They need for us to participate, to help them, but also to be an example to them what they can do. I said it last week and wrote it on the board. I can do that. We have the ability built into us by God to do anything, but we have to trust God, trust him to get it done through us. God is not going to do all the work. We want him to do all. In other words, we think God 
just sits in heaven and wait on us to tell him what to do. Amen, Wall. Because we do, we wait to see if God is just going to do it because we say God told me he was going to do it. God said he was going to do it. And because we say God said it, we settle on that. We need to operate by faith. And let me tell you this about faith. Because we, I know people use the scripture all the time it's in, in Hebrews 11 and 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me ask the question, now, just, and it's rhetorical for you guys who are here in the studio with me. But you think about it. I'm going to show you how much faith we have. We say, you know, you know I, I don't have any faith. I don't have any faith. I'm not talking about religious faith. I'm talking about spiritual faith. I'm talking relationship faith. Let me show you how much faith that you had. When you came into this studio and you walked over to this chair that you're sitting down in, how many of us in this studio asked the chair, could you hold me? None of us. Did you ask the chair, could it hold you or did you just sit down? Down. You sat down by faith. You didn't question the chair. And yet God simply said, if you're going to have that kind of faith, have that kind of faith in me that you trust me without questioning me. Just do what I said do. And you know, see this faith in that chair. You don't know anything about the person who built the chair. You don't know where the chair came from. You don't know who designed it. God is the same way. Say so you, you didn't see me. You don't see the designer. But you see the design, I created you. Only thing I require of you is to walk by that faith. Trust that faith. Do it by faith. You sat down by faith. You're going to stand up by faith. You're going to walk by faith. God said, hey, you trust things, but how come you don't trust me? That's a bit tough, isn't it? Tough but true. We constantly say things. I'm talking about parents. I'm talking about uh, uh, educators out here. All of us, if you're doing things, you're doing it by faith anyway. But God's requirement is that you trust him to help you through that as well. See, we think too highly of ourselves. I, I can do this. I can do this. You're not doing it on your own. You're doing it by faith. It must be. It will be. And as a matter of fact, really, truly, none of us could do anything without faith. Right. Without faith, the Bible said, it's impossible to please God. So are we really, truly doing what God has assigned us to do? You're a spirit being. I'm a spirit being. You are in a physical body that God placed you in. He placed you in, here in these physical bodies, all of us, with an expiration date. None of us are going to be here too much longer. If you're here 100 years, seem like a long time. But you're going to leave. We're going to leave. God put us in these physical bodies. Those of us who are parents, I'm talking again to parents. I'm talking again to educators. You have a responsibility. Whether you know it or not, you have a responsibility to God. You have a responsibility to that child. You have a responsibility to that neighbor. Whatever is going on around us, you still have a responsibility to turn the light on so people can see that you have an intimate relationship with the God of heaven, the God of creation. If they do not see it, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Dads, don't talk about how much you love your children and you swearing and cursing and drinking and smoking and carousing and womanizing and all these things. You're going to say, well, you know what? I'm not perfect. Oh, well, no, no. That's your excuse. Here's what I'm going to put this up here, too. Some of this we're going to constantly come back to. You're going to have two things that happen to us with this. You're either going to make Or you're going to make this. <clears throat> what we tend to do is make excuses. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. Hear that a lot, don't we? Yeah. I'm not God. I'm not perfect. I'm not Jesus. So either we're going to make excuses or make adjustments. If we make adjustments, that means that I recognize that there's something wrong that I can be doing better. Making excuses is simply saying, hey, I'm satisfied with where I am. And it's okay. It's okay for me to be on this side. It's okay for me to make excuses. But God simply say, okay, that doesn't hold water with me. So you need to take a step 
over and make an adjustment. Make some adjustments. Are we making adjustments? Are we going to continually make excuses? God is not into our excuse making. He doesn't take excuses from us and we can do it all day long. But remember what we said a few weeks ago. We need to reflect. We need to reflect on where we are at. We need to reflect also inspect. That's a personal evaluation. Personally look at yourself. How messed up are we? You want to know how messed up you are? You already know. We need to inspect. Inspect. Self-examination. Then that self-examination means you're dissecting things. You're taking it apart. I need to look at myself in excruciating light. I need to see myself as I've never looked at myself before. Let me put this on the board. And Mr. Finley, I know you, you know this because we talked about this before. Here's a word that we don't like to see about ourselves, that we are we don't want to know that we don't think we're evil. I'm not evil. I'm a good person. I am. I'm a good, I, yes, there you go. I am a good person. I don't do anything like, I'm not, no, I'm a good person. You trying to tell me I'm evil? I'm not evil. Man, that's your opinion. No, not according to Matthew chapter 7. When Jesus said, if you being evil, we're evil. So why we do the things that we do is because we're evil by nature. We want what we want when we want it. Don't we? Absolutely. I don't care about what it, nothing else. I just want what I want. When I want it, how I want it, as long as I want it. We're evil people. We're evil, evil, evil. I'm going to say that because it, it may like, sound like it's a glitch. It's not a glitch. I'm saying it. You're evil, evil, evil. Period. We're evil people who know how to do good things. We're not good people who happen to do bad things. I'm a good man. I'm looking for a good man. Well, you're going to keep looking. I'm looking for a good woman. You're going to keep looking because none of us are good. How do we know that? I'll give you the scriptures. Go out here and you read it. Maybe you'll email me about it and question it later on. But it's Psalms chapter, Psalms number 14, Psalms 14 talks about that. It's saying that we, God looked down from heaven to see if there's any good that, that did right. He said he couldn't find none. No, not one. We are evil people. We just want what we want. And believe it or not, we will step on one another to achieve things. I don't care about you. I don't care about uh, Mr. Finley. I don't care about Mr. Walker. I don't care about me. What's in it for me? I don't care how it affects my family. What's in it for me? I don't care how it affects my children. What's in it for me? It's all about me. Me, 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 me. Whether we like it or not, this is a part of us. We're evil. But in spite of us being evil, God simply paves the way. He said, okay, I'm going to do this. All you need to do is, and God said this. God said, trust my son. What is he saying? He said, look, guys, I know you can't do this on your own. You're all messed up. You're evil. Since you can't do it, I'm going to send somebody who can do it. I'm going to send my son, just like you came. I'm going to send him in a body, a human body, like we showed about the infant. He's going to grow up. He's going to become a child, just like you became a child. He's going to become an adolescent, just like you an adolescent. He's going to become an adult, just like you an adult. He's going to, guess what? He's going to get tired. He's going to be sleepy. He's going to need to eat. He's going to be tempted. And all those things that have happened to him, God simply said, he's going to take away all of these. He's going to take away every one of those from you. Why? Because God said, Christ came in the flesh. Christ came in the flesh. Why? He came in the flesh because he had to show us that if he could do it, you can do it. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, really. He said, if he could do it, you can do it. 
But but Lord, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. I I I I I can't do that. You see, because I'm a good person. I'm a good person. No, you're evil. Because when we're evil, we constantly make excuses for the evils that we do, don't we? God said, trust my son. He came in the flesh. He did it so you can do it. He hungered. So if you get hungry, know that, hey, he overcame the hunger. He overcame the thirsty. He was sleeping. He overcame the beatings. All of this. Why? Because God simply said you have to make adjustments. You and I must make constant adjustments. And how often should those adjustments be made? Every day, every moment of our lives, we should be making adjustments. Adjustments should be made. People should see us making those spiritual adjustments. Why those spiritual adjustments being made? Because we are in an a intimate relationship with God's son. See, I don't make excuses when I surrender my will to God's will. I only make excuses when I can't get what I want. See, that's not an adjustment. That's just an excuse. God doesn't care about us making excuses. Because he simply said, look, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust you? God is not into us making those excuses. He just wants to see what you are willing to do if given an opportunity. You are a spirit being. I am a spirit being. We're in physical bodies that God has given to us so that we can make the proper kind of decision. Those decisions will affect other people's lives. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk because we believe what God has said, not just that we're quoting what he said. It's easy to quote the Bible. I hear that so much. In the last 48 years in the ministry I've had, I've had thousands of people quote scriptures. Thousands upon thousands quoting scriptures. Pastors out there quoting scriptures. Deacons quoting scriptures. Everybody in the church is quoting scriptures. Everyone is talking about heaven. But nobody really talks about how evil we are and how many excuses we make and the things that we do that are negative, the things that we do that are hurting other people. We are, we are the ones getting in the way. We say that, hey, these kids aren't listening. These kids are rebellious. These kids are disobedient. These kids are doing this, this, and this. We enumerate lists upon lists of things that our children are doing. And those very lists that we give our children, God says, you need to make a review of that list for yourself. Because everything on there you are saying for them, I'm expecting you to do. The difference between excuses and adjustment is my adjustment is that I recognize the fact that what God said is true. He said we're evil. I know some of you out there may send me an email or two and say, hey, brother, you know what? That was just your opinion. I'm not an evil person. I'm a good person. And there's nothing wrong with me. Well, when you say that, that lets me know there's a lot wrong with you, because when we lift ourselves up, that's. That's arrogance and that's sin. And the Bible says pride goes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before the fall. So that means that I'm walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. When I want you to see me glowing in a particular light, I don't shine bright unless I'm shining through Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. If we're talking about unlocking power, you can't unlock that power till you know where the power comes from. This power doesn't come from me. It comes through me because of what God is doing. This is what we have to look at on a daily basis. What? i leave that. See, this is important. What God said. What God said. How often are you talking about what God said or are you talking about what you say? Here's what we do a lot of. Oh, let me put this down here. We know the gospel more than we know the gospel. Gospel, don't we? Oh, man, when it's something that I need to talk to you, man, you know what? I got something to tell you. Man, you got, you won't believe what I heard. But how many times do we spend some of that time talking about our relationship with Jesus Christ? We don't. 
But I can tell you all about what's going on in my neighbor's house or what's going on down the street, what's happening on the job. All that gossip, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Brother, what you got? What you got? But when it concerns the gospel, we're like, man, I don't, I don't have time to hear all that stuff. You, that religious stuff now. You're talking religion. No, I'm not. We're not talking religion. We're talking relationship. See, all you have to do is tell them, you know what? I'm talking about a relationship. I want to know about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to know your relationship with God. What is your relationship like? Oh, man, let me tell you about what's happened last week. I got some stuff, man. You, you got to hear this. You got to hear it. I know, man. You, you, I know, brother, you will appreciate what I'm about to tell you. I want all the gossip you got. But I don't want to hear nothing about no gospel. I don't hear nothing about no Jesus Christ. I don't want to hear nothing about going to heaven. Because I don't believe in no heaven anyway. I don't believe in doing any of this. So we are quick to embrace nonsense. But we want to embrace what can change a person's direction for their lives. I'm going to say this again. I'll say it again and again. If we want our children to be better, we have to do better. If we want them to listen to us, we better be listening to God. If we want them to change how they do things, we need to change how we do things. We need to make some adjustments. It's easy to make excuses. But where are the adjustments coming in? We are spirit beings housed in these physical bodies that God has given to us so we can be examples to other people. Our young people, our young people are dying on a daily basis looking for help. They're looking for somebody to come to and say, brother, can you help me? Will you listen to me? How many of us are too busy to listen when somebody comes to us and, and want help? You know what? Let me see. I, 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 let me see. I, let, me, uh, let me see. I'm going to see if I got a little time uh, to do. You know what? My time. You know what? Uh, wait a minute. How about next Wednesday at three o'clock? Next Wednesday at three o'clock, we can talk about what's going on in your life. Because, brother, I don't have time right now. That's not how God operates. God is serious about what we're doing. Are we serious about what we're doing for him? I wrote some books. Now, you hear me time and time again refer to the fact that I've written some books. But the books don't mean a thing if you don't read them. No more than the Bible. God's requirement is that you read the Bible if you want to understand him. And I've only been given assignment to write some books for us to see God in simplicity. Because some of us are afraid to pick up the Bible because, oh, man, I don't get to the ye and the ye and the thous and the this and that and the other. And the Bible is so confusing. Well, understand this about the Bible. The Bible is not confusing, but the Bible is a spiritual book. So you just can't go into the spiritual book with a natural mind and think to understand it. God does not work that way. And you have to be where God is to understand who God is. Isn't that true? God says you have to be on this level with me. Amos 3 and 3 say, can two walk together except to be agreed? God simply said, you and I need to be like this if we're going to talk. It can't be like meet God up here and you're down here and say, I think I know what God said. I think I know what he meant by that. No, if you want to know what God meant, you got to come up here and meet God where he is and allow him to explain it to you what you need to do, what you need to say, the way you need to live. If you do that, you won't be making excuses, but you'll be making adjustments. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Wait a minute. Truth. Yeah, that means you don't lie. God don't want to hear the lies. You already know we lie. All the time. You know, we say God is good all the time. You say we lie all the time. Because the reason we lie is because we want people to look at us in a certain light and see us a certain way. And that's not according to what God wants. His mandate is, turn the light on. There's lights on in this room. God simply said, I need to see. And here's the thing about God. He already knows the truth about us. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. Right. Since he already knows the truth about us, go on. You like, you want to say something? Excuses, adjustment. The third word, how much is impact from the first two words? Well, impact means that once I made that adjustment, People will see the impact by what I'm doing 
because I moved beyond just saying I made an adjustment. It's like adjusting the seat. Okay, you adjust yourself in the seat, but you didn't do anything until you what? Get out of the seat. When you get out of the seat, you're making a, an adjustment mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. All those it go together. So when I make that mental adjustment and that emotional adjustment and that spiritual adjustment, that leads me down the path I need to go in order to become the person I need to be for others to see who I am and who will also appreciate who I am and what they see. So when you, you talk about beyond the adjustment, that's what it is. Adjustment is, is, you know, you have to be just in it. It's got to mean something. It has to mean something. When you make an adjustment, that means it means something to me. It's not just words. See, these words need to take on a life. And they have meaning, too. Our words have meanings. They have meaning because, because people need to see something, don't they? You know, they want to see if you are what you say you are. You know, you don't have to tell me you lie. I just have to watch you. I'll see the lies come out of you. If you are a truth bearer, all I do is watch you. I want to see the truth. Either the light is good or the light is bad. Either the light is on or the light is off. So in light of what you're saying, adjustment means we move over. That means that there's a process. There's a process that takes place, and we need to look at that process. Am I in that process? Am I part of that process? Is God a part of that process? With the, Am I making that adjustment? Am I also, and what you talked about as far as adjustment, that means that's part of the unlocking. You have to unlock. You can't unlock what you're not aware that you have. And God simply says, I need for you to unlock something. I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you the, the ability to unlock it. But see, having the ability and not having the willingness doesn't do any good then, does it? You have the, the ability to unlock the power, but you don't have the willingness to do it. We must have both. We have to have that willingness and the ability because God simply said, I'm going to put it before you. I'll need to go, and I'm going to go back to what we said earlier. I need to see if you love me enough to do it. Do you love me enough to take that step and make that adjustment? Okay. I hope that answered the question. Because this is easy. This happens all day, every day. Excuses, excuses, excuses. So we can be evil, because we are. But God simply says you need to make some adjustments, because we can. God is never going to put something in our path that we can't deal with. Whatever it is. And I'm talking to those who are out there watching as well. Whatever the situation is, whatever the circumstance, if you don't feel that you can deal with it, God will bring you people who can help you overcome whatever it is that you're going through, whatever the adversity is. And believe me, we're here to help. We're here to help you get better. All of this will make a bit of difference if you don't implement it, if you don't make the adjustments that are necessary. And when we make those adjustments, things begin to happen. And they can happen positively or negatively. And there's some things we're gonna talk about next week. We're, we're gonna talk about how we file away things. And there's two simple files that every one of us put everything in, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. There's a file system. All of us have a filing system. Some of those filing systems are filed up systems. And we're going to talk about, again, how to make that adjustment when it concerns those files. You're going to be given something, and whatever you've been given, you're going to put it somewhere, and you'll know exactly where it is. And we know exactly where things are and what needs to be changed. So next week, I'm looking forward to you guys being here with us again and hoping that this week was fruitful informative and enlightening because there's a lot more where that came from and I didn't even hit all the notes we have on there because we have some things that we want to talk about. Next week we'll enumerate some of those things so we can be better equipped and better prepared to do the things that we have been assigned to do. We are here to make a difference. And with that, I'll see everybody next week. <laughs>